Good morning and welcome to worship this Sunday, the 27th of September. Our worship begins in the Book of Common Prayer on page 355 or on the first page of your bulletin found in this week's epistle. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me in saying the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to all people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 8. We will say this together. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. <clears throat> the God of my salvation, in you I have trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. O 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say, from heaven, he will say to us, why did you not believe him? But if we say, of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, in our gospel reading this morning, Jesus drops a bombshell uh, that would have been utterly radical uh, for his original audience. Uh, he's speaking with some chief priests and elders. I mean, these are the people in that society in the first century that if you were a parent, you wanted your kid to grow up to be just like them. The chief priests and the elders were the model of religion and the way to live. In fact, only the cream of the crop, only the smartest kids even were given the opportunity to be, to be trained as teachers of the law. And the thing you never wanted your kid to grow up to become was a tax collector. I mean, they were in the same category as sinners and prostitutes. And Jesus makes this declaration in front of the whole crowd, including the elders and the chief priests. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. What? I mean, that just would have been so uh, flipping the whole world upside down. So I want to unpack this. There's really a lot here that's more than fascinating. It's actually a profound invitation for us in our present day lives. The first thing we need to wrestle with and ask is, what is the kingdom of God? If the tax collectors and prostitutes are going there ahead of the chief priests and the elders, what is it? You know, for a long time, I believed that the kingdom of God was kind of a place, like a place you go to after you die. And in one sense, he was saying, like heaven, these uh, tax collectors and prostitutes are going to get into heaven ahead of the chief priests and the elders. But that doesn't make any sense in the way that Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. That Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God is within, present tense. So it can't be a place we're going to in the future. Jesus referred to it in the present tense. So really, the kingdom of God is not so much a place we go to as a place we see from. The kingdom of God is a whole new lens on reality. That Jesus was inviting us to a whole new consciousness, a new way to see the world through the eyes of Christ consciousness. And it changes everything. It changes the way we view ourselves, the way we view other people, certainly the way we understand God, and even all of creation. And so Jesus was inviting everyone into this new consciousness 
a new way to see everything. And he's saying that the prostitutes and the tax collectors are gaining this new lens on reality, are experiencing this new consciousness ahead of the elders, the teachers of the law, and the chief priests. And that makes sense as we look at how the Gospels unfold. Remember that the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they flocked to Jesus. They loved being around Him. They felt so safe with Him. He was a loving, welcoming space, and they experienced profound transformation in their lives. Conversely, it was the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, that they despised Jesus, that they felt so attacked by Him, and they actually literally wanted to kill Him. So how is it, why is it, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are so open to this new consciousness, this new way of viewing everything, and the, tax co- and the chief priests and the elders are so closed down. Well, the heart of the invitation to the kingdom of God, it requires us to examine everything in our lives and reorient ourselves to a new compass, to God's compass of evaluating what really matters. That the world, even 2,000 years ago in that first century context, the world was telling them that your identity is significant if you're a chief priest that you're earning God's favor by your fastidious adherence to the law. Or if you're wealthy, just like today, if you're wealthy, that says you're doing something right and our culture rewards you with respect and adoration. And in the kingdom of God, Jesus says, your worth, your identity, has nothing to do with externals. You can't earn a wit because you've already got it fully. Your identity is simply this, you are God's beloved. And in the kingdom of God, Jesus says, your security does not come from the size of your bank account or your 401k. Your security comes from trusting in the loving presence of God to provide for you like a child. Let go of the burden of thinking that your security comes externally. And learn to abide like a child and trust that your Father will provide for you. And also we discover that Jesus is saying power in the kingdom of God is not what we see in Rome. It's not what we see in the world. It is not dominance. It is not uh, servility either. That it's a new way of co-creation that when we learn that we can abide and we don't have to power over or dominate others, we recognize that we can co-create with God in a profoundly world-transforming, different kind of way. But to do that, it means you have to let go. You cannot cling to your old identities. So now, in understanding the kingdom of God this way, this makes sense. Because when Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom of God to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, and saying, listen, y'all have to let go. When he met with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he went and ate with him. And when Zacchaeus heard the good news that his identity and security did not come externally, but was abiding in this love of Christ, then he joyfully let go of all the money that he'd stolen from people and paid people back four times what he owed them. It was a joy. He did not cling to that old identity or that old security. He let it go. He surrendered it. And he experienced new life. In the same way with the prostitutes and the other sinners, they know their lives aren't going well. So when Jesus says, it is time to reevaluate everything, they say, wonderful, because I don't like, I'm not clinging to any of these old identities, and I'm open to discovering my identity as God's beloved. But conversely, the chief priests, the elders, They had spent their whole lives cultivating an identity that the culture rewarded them with. They had spent their lives being told that because of their strict adherence to the law, that they had a closer relationship with God, and that they were kind of superior to everybody else in ways. And Jesus approaches them and says, that's not true at all. You are no more loved or valuable than these tax collectors and these prostitutes. In fact, you're hypocrites. Jesus would call them and say, you are whitewashed tombs with dead men's bones inside. You look really pretty on the outside, but on the inside, you're rotting. You don't know what love is. And when they heard that, instead of opening up to this new message of the kingdom of God, they clung to their identity. They clung to their identity that they were righteous in their own eyes, that they believed they were righteous in God's eyes because of their works. And instead of letting go of those, they clung to them all the more and actually wanted to kill Jesus for threatening their identity. Same thing, if we remember the rich young ruler, Jesus met him, it says, I love this sentence, Jesus looked at him, and he loved him, and the rich young ruler said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus recognized that this guy's money was preventing him from experiencing real joy and security. So he said to him, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, then come and follow me. 
He was inviting him to a new lens on reality, a kingdom lens that your security comes from God, providing for you every day and not from your wealth. And it says the man went away sad because he was very, very wealthy. Now, we don't ultimately know what happened to him, but what Jesus was doing was saying, let go, stop clinging to your false security of wealth and trust me, trust in divine presence to support, buoy, provide for you. And it was very hard for him to let go. He went away sad because he could not let go of clinging to that. And that same invitation is for us today because we are bombarded with messages of where our security, where our identity, where our power comes from. Certainly it's within the church. I mean, I think an apt comparison of what was said by Jesus 2,000 years ago is that the meth dealers and the gangsters are getting, ahead of the, getting into the kingdom of God ahead of the priests and the deacons and the vestry members. That it is so easy, even within church culture, to begin to think that because I've got this little tab on, that maybe I'm a little closer to God, and Jesus says, rubbish, not true. That everyone is equally connected. We are in this together. No one is more valuable than anybody else. And if I can let go of some superficial egoic identity as clergy and open up to the even greater gorgeous reality that I'm immersed in divine love and you're immersed in divine love all of the time, well, that's real freedom. But it's difficult. I mean, shoot, we know how it is, even within our Holy Trinity community. I mean, it is so easy to think that someone that went to an Ivy League school is kind of superior, or someone with a lot more wealth, or this kind of membership, or these kind of friends, or this kind of physique, or these kind of clothes or outfits. We begin to fall into what these messages that our culture has bombarded us with, where wealth and security and identity is found. And the invitation of Jesus 2,000 years ago is the same for us today, to surrender, to let go, to trust, to open up to a new consciousness, a new way of seeing everything. Our first reading in Philippians gives us a powerful invitation to that. In there we find a famous, famous poem. And it's about Jesus. It was clearly known in the first century. He says, Though his state was that of God, yet he did not deem equality with God something he should cling to. Rather, he emptied himself, and assuming the state of a slave, he was born in human likeness. There's so much going on here, but the word that I really want to draw your attention to is rather he emptied himself, that Jesus emptied himself. And the Greek word there is kenosis. It means let go, surrender. And the opposite word of kenosis is found in the previous statement. Though, he was, the, though his state was that of God, he did not deem equality with God something he should cling to. Clinging to those identities is the opposite of kenosis, of emptying ourselves. And that's the heart of Jesus' message. When Jesus invites us to the kingdom, it's almost all language of surrender, of letting go, of trusting. He says, don't be afraid. Let go. Abide. Abide in my love. Don't cling. Don't hoard. Don't use power over others. Don't fret. All of this language is surrender and letting go. That's the invitation of the gospel. Not to power over, not to cling to, not to attain or earn. We can't attain or earn the presence of God because we've already got it fully. We simply grow an awareness of it. As we surrender and let go, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see things through Christ consciousness. And we begin to allow that healing flow of the kingdom of God in our lives to overflow into the world. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in affirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, saying, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for Kimberly Dunn, postulant for the priesthood, and Maureen Flack and Joe Zugan, candidates preparing for the deaconite. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, especially Suzanne, Susie K. Grace, and Patricia Dillon. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Good morning. We're glad to have you with us on this Sunday. Just a couple of announcements here. One is that, as you can see, we have begun to add Holy Eucharist back into our worship, both online and in person. Um, we have our safety protocols in place, of course, for our in-person worship, but we're grateful to begin making this small step uh, toward our full regathering. Also, remember, we are gathering in person on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock for worship. We invite you to attend. You can sign up through your epistle. Um, right now, we're able to take the first 25. We hope to expand that uh, in the near future. Our new rector, the Reverend David Umflett, begins his ministry at Holy Trinity on Thursday, October 1st. During his first full week with us, we are inviting small groups to join him for a short worship service, which will include time for your questions. Those meetings are happening at 10 a.m. and will happen either via Zoom on Monday, October 5th, Wednesday, October 7th, and Friday, October 9th, or in person on Tuesday, October 6th, and Thursday, October 8th. Those meetings that are happening in person will happen on the covered terrace, and we will of course follow uh, COVID-19 safety protocols such as mask wearing, social distancing, and hand washing. So each date is limited to 20 persons, so we invite you to sign up in the link that can be found in your epistle. Again, that's 10 a.m., and we hope to see you there. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and an unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Be known to us, Lord Jesus. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of the God who loves you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Go forth into the world to love and serve the Lord, carrying hope and love to all whom you meet on this earthly pilgrimage. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.